Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Lou Little over here at State Unity Life. Lou, it's about time I got a call from you. Yeah, I know. But then our nice, quiet, wealthy clientele hasn't been giving us any trouble. Up to now. What's the problem now? Johnny, I, I've got a crazy writer on my hands. Well, maybe not crazy. Actually, he's a very nice old guy, but you know how writers are. Do I? Well, don't you? Only writer I have any contact with is Johnstone. The man who dramatizes these cases of mine to put them on the air. And he's uh, perfectly normal? Well, let's see. He's kind of a nut about fishing. You and, see, uh... if it isn't fishing, it's something else. So, so help me, every one of them has, well, they've got some peculiarity. Look, Lou, if liking to fish is a peculiarity, I'm the nuttiest guy around. Well, you know what I mean. They get so wrapped up in things. Anyhow, this man, this author, is a nut on murder. Writes nothing but murder stories. That's all he thinks about. So that makes him a killer? Can you think of anyone better qualified to plan a perfect crime? You have reason to think something like that's going on, Lou? Maybe. Maybe you better come on over here and let me tell you about it. Yeah. Maybe I better. <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed Expenser Cup, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to State Unity Life Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the imperfect crime matter. Expense account item one... $4.26 for a tank full of gas. As long as I could fill up my own car on the expense account, why not? When I got to his office, Lou Little wasted no time in getting to the point. Bodyguard. Well, I'd say that's up to you after you've heard the facts in the case. Go ahead, shoot. Must say, though, I can't think of a nicer job than acting as a bodyguard for her. Her? And I mean, what a body. And all that goeth with, wow. Then you meant authoress rather than author. No, Johnny, I'm talking about Mrs. Porter. Porter? That's right, Denise Porter. The wife of G. Stanley Porter? That's right. You know him? No, but I'd like to. I doubt that. Lou, in my book, he is one of the best mystery writers alive. Oh, no question of it. And over the years, he's done very well for himself. Well, he deserves to. That man can take the simplest plot and build it up into a fantastic mystery in his descriptions, Lou, of people and places and things where he can almost make you see them just the way he does. What's his problem? Hers, Johnny. And I've, I've asked her over here to tell you about her herself. Well, then bring her on. She should have got here before you did. At least, let me tell you this while we're waiting. Yeah? We sold them both life insurance policies right after they got married a little over a year ago. Each made the other the beneficiary? Right. How large are the policies? 750000 apiece. What? Double indemnity. <whistles> yep. One and a half million dollars in case of death of either one of them. And now they're not getting along, hmm? Apparently they're not. You see, Johnny... Oh... Your secretary said to come right in, Mr. Little. Yes, do, please. Come in. And suddenly I began to hear sweet music. That whole office took on a kind of soft, warm, pleasant glow around one of the prettiest girls I've ever seen. Denise, maybe 26 or 7, tall, blonde, and beautiful. Her complexion, faintly tanned, was flawless. And her figure... Well, her expensive, carefully tailored clothes, even a few carefully chosen pieces of fine jewelry she wore, seemed almost tawdry compared to the girl herself. Her eyes were a warm, rich brown. Yet there was a twinkle there, a sparkle that was almost an invitation. But in her eyes, as she talked to us, came... Came what? Apprehension? Fear? I'm not sure, but it was disturbing. And it isn't as though my husband hasn't been good to me. He has. Almost too good. A, a little too considerate. But, well, there's been something insincere about it lately. You ask me, Johnny. It's like giving him the condemned one a hearty last meal. That's a horrible way to put it, Mr. Little. Well, maybe that's what it amounts to. Yes, he, he's been so moody, so morose lately. Why? Have you given him any cause? No, of course not. I'm afraid it's just because... Well, you see, I... Go on, Denise. Johnny, I don't know how to say it. I I thought that our marriage would be different, not like the others. You've been married before? No. 
but he has. And I just found out all about it. Mm. And not just once, Johnny, but four times. Four other wives. Happy as a lark with every one of them, too, for a couple of years. And then? Then each of them died. Suddenly, unexpectedly. Under suspicious circumstances? Apparently not at all. Apparently a couple of them were accidents. But mind, I use that word, apparently. He's such a master of the perfect crime, Johnny. In his writing, I mean. But don't you see? That's all he thinks about. Planning perfect crimes, perfect murders. It's, it's almost an obsession with him. And when I found out that right after each of them died, he'd written another book about the murder of a woman... But to commit a crime and then put it into a book would be ridiculous. What I said about authors still goes, Johnny. Well, do you or you, Denise, have any real reason for thinking that he might have murdered his other wives? Four in a row? And each of them after only a year or two? And each of them well insured? Doesn't prove anything, Lou? Not the least suspicious, huh? Well, of course I am, but if nobody's been able to prove I'm anything... Scared. Why... I'm scared, Johnny. The way he's been acting lately. And this... Just not knowing what he's thinking or planning. If only I could know what he's writing about. Locked up there in his study every day, all day long, most of the night. And I lie there alone in my bed every night, wondering what sort of a clever, diabolical trap he's setting for me. If he is. I'm sure he is. And the same thing will happen to me that happened to the other four. Unless you can help me. Unless he falls into his trap himself. How long has this been going on, Denise? Months now, Johnny. Several months. Well, so she finally called this morning and asked for you. Please, Johnny. Will you help me? Will you protect me from whatever trap he's setting for me? Of course he will, Denise. I'm not sure. You're not sure? Johnny. Let me think about it. No? I'll be in touch. Maybe in a couple of days. <laughs> If you ever suffer a touch of arthritis or rheumatism and you've never tried mentholatum deep heating rub, you can't know how good its deep heating action can make you feel. As you massage it into painful areas, you feel its deep heating action. You know relief is on the way. Mentholatum deep heating rub is an extra strong combination of active ingredients for safe, temporary relief of minor arthritic rheumatic pain. Use greaseless, stainless mentholatum deep heating rub often. I went back to my apartment to think this one over. I couldn't imagine anything pleasanter than acting as a bodyguard for a beautiful Denise Porter. But the more I thought about it, the more I wondered. No question but that an author, constantly preoccupied with planning the perfect crime, would be the most likely to get away with it, or at least to think he could. I'd told Denise I wasn't sure if I'd take on the case. I was sure. Only I didn't want her to know it. Not yet. Especially in view of the fact that when she pulled a handkerchief out of her bag in Lou's office, a plane ticket had dropped out. A ticket to New York. Okay, item two, 90 cents for a phone call to New York to my old pal, Lieutenant Randy Singer of the 18th Precinct. Then I hopped into my car and drove out to the home of G. Stanley Porter, author... It was an old place, but in its way, a very handsome one. The front door of heavy oak led into a large reception hall, its floor of polished marble. At the right was the entrance to a huge living room. At the left, a long, straight staircase, also of oak, going up to the second floor in a sort of gallery with various bedroom doors facing on it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That front door was opened for me by a man in his late 50s. Tall, well-built, handsome, with a shock of white hair. Yeah? Mr. Porter? That's right. My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. By all means, come in. Thank you. I don't know what brings you here, but I can assure you it's a real pleasure to see you. Thank you again. I've been following these exciting exploits of yours for years on the radio. I'm glad to hear that. I see now. About six feet, huh? That's right. Perhaps 160 pounds. On the nose. Dark hair and eyes of, uh... Gray, is it? Mm -hmm. And built like a steel spring, I'm sure. <laughs> Just the way I've always visualized you. But, uh, how will I do for you? Your wife isn't at home. Oh. I see. She's been uh, checking with you or one of your companies about our insurance. Something like that, yes. Well, now, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I can assure you we have all we need. And surely they aren't making you fill in your time as 
An ordinary salesman? <laughs> no, Mr. Porter. It's just that where policies the size of yours are involved, we, uh, we like to keep in touch, that's all. Well, it's a matter of making sure that we're hale and hearty and able to keep up these fantastic premiums they charge for a man of my age. I can assure you that everything's all right. Well, seeing this home of yours and the way it's kept, I'm sure it is. No, I'm a writer, you know. I certainly do know. I've read and thoroughly enjoyed most of your books. And things have been going nicely for me, financially, I mean. And, well, as long as I have the money, I like to surround myself with beautiful things, this home, the garden, beautiful painting. And a beautiful wife. Yes. Denise is beautiful, isn't she? Very. Young, beautiful, full of vitality. Yes, I'm very lucky for a man of my age. And I suspect that all she needs to do is ask, and you give her everything she wants. Everything? Well, I try, but... Working the way I do, the long hours alone. You see, Dollar, my writing is a sort of compulsion. Writing is my whole life. I get ideas from uh, from everything, from everyone I meet. Now, it may sound morbid, but even the passing of my former wives, and believe me, I love them dearly, gave me ideas for stories. And if I don't get them down on paper and work them out immediately, well, I have to, or I'll lose them. You understand that, Dollar? Yeah, I think so. Oh. But apart from some of my, uh, perhaps too much of my time, I, I try to give her everything to keep her happy. And, of course, when I die, she'll have not only my insurance, but other things and money as well. It's the least I can do when you consider how she, she nursed me back to health from an almost fatal illness. And if she dies before you? Have that happen again? Lose her, my little Denise, the way the other... Sorry, Dolly, forgive me. I'm uh, sorry she isn't here. She went down to New York with some of her girlfriends, and she won't be back until after the theater. Mm -hmm. Well, it really doesn't make any difference, I guess. Uh, as long as you're here, come along. Up to my study on the second floor. Only it's really where I practically live these days with the book I work on. Uh -huh. I'd, uh... I'd like to talk further with you. Who knows? Maybe some of your exciting adventures will give me plot material. I'll lead the way. Well, you coming? Yes. Yes. Well, why do you say it that way? A little surprised, perhaps, at the way I uh, move around this place? More than a little, Mr. Porter. Why? Just because I happen to be totally blind? Up there in his study, only it was a small, complete apartment. I tried to speak further with Mr. Porter about his wife. But all he'd talk of was plots for his own it, and ask about some of my relatively mild experiences as an insurance investigator. Despite the fact his interest lay only in the fine points of winter, I found his conversation fascinating. Later, after making and pouring enough cocktails to give both of us a bit of an edge, he opened the door of a sort of a built-in kitchenette and fixed one of the most delicious steak dinners I've had in years. And with such ease and sureness of touch, I almost forgot that he was completely blind. Well, enjoy your steak, Johnny. Prime, well hung, and broiled to a tea. Fine. Now, just let me get these dishes cleaned up and we can talk some more. Ah, uh, you can give me some more of your ideas. Uh, no, 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 you don't. Now, you I'll stay right there. Dishes. You stay right there and finish your cigarette and coffee. I'm the host. I'm the boss. All right. Tell me, uh, you always eat your dinner up here? Well, when Denise is away, which is rather often these days. But my real fun is in raiding the big refrigerator downstairs every night, long about two or three in the morning, after I put my typewriter away. Mm-hmm. Mr. Porter? No. Yeah. I think I would like to raid that icebox with you. Fine, fine. Maybe for two or three nights, if necessary. Oh. Oh, of course, I'd be delighted to have you stay over. Provided one thing. What's that? That neither your wife nor anyone else knows that I'm staying in this house. Some, uh, some little mystery you're cooking up for me, Johnny? Yeah, something like that. And while you're doing those dishes... I'll go down and move my car over to the next block. A hunch? No, not at this point. Just lay it to experience. Some long, sometimes pretty unpleasant experience. 
When I went out to move my car, I put in another call to New York. That's item four to Lieutenant Randy Singer. And what he had to say told me that I'd guessed right. That's right. He met her at the plane. She got off alone? All alone. Now, I don't know yet who he is, Johnny, but don't worry. I'll find out for you. And where'd they go? Well, like I said, before they started the round of the nightclubs, they made that one stop. At a machine tool supplier's? Yeah. And all he bought and gave to her was a... Yeah, you told me. Okay, Randy. Thanks a lot. It all added up. And why call me in on the whole thing? As a cover-up, of course. To convince me so that I would convince the law when it was all over that Mr. G. Stanley Porter had slipped up. With his mind on his book, he'd forgotten the trap he'd set. That he'd fallen into it himself. That's what it would look like, all right. And what was the trap? Johnny, this, uh, this mysterious behavior of yours intrigues me more than you may realize. Well, who knows? Maybe you'll get some material for a story. Well, at least give me some clues to what you're up to. Later, Mr. Porter. Maybe later. Maybe tomorrow. Whatever you say. Have a drink? No, thanks. I'm fine. See, uh, maybe that I'm ahead of you. Uh... Huh? What is it, sir? Front door. Denise is home. Now, as I told you, Johnny, she'll stop in here for a minute to say goodnight to me. So if you uh, want to go through this little stunt of hiding from her, she's coming up the stairs now. I'll uh, get to my typewriter. When I look back on it, the business of hiding in that tiny kitchenette with the door open only a crack seems almost childish, like a couple of kids playing mystery story. But believe me, this was playing for keeps... Still working, darling? Yeah, unusual. Did you enjoy the play, my dear? Oh, the other girls seem to like it. How's it all about? Oh, you know, usual thing. Oh, I'm terribly tired, dear. I, I think I'll... Oh, there's plenty of milk and a nice chocolate cake. Your favorite kind in the refrigerator. You know, for your late, late supper. Thank you. Night, dear. Night, well, my fellow conspirator, you may come out now. Kind of a silly sort of a game, I suppose. Is it? Well, isn't it? I wonder. You wonder what? Oh, I was thinking that uh, maybe I'd let you see the uh, manuscript story I'm working on. Later on, perhaps. What have you been saying? Well, it might be quite apropos to this, uh, this game of ours with Denise. Except, of course, that uh, I haven't written the ending yet. Is that why you've been so interested in talking with me, having me here, Mr. Porter, in the hope that maybe I can help you write the ending? I'm not sure. Not yet. Mm. Tell me this, Mr. Porter. Is there by any chance a character in it like... like yourself? A man without sight who nonetheless manages to get around his home as though he could see as well as I do. I'm not going to tell you a thing, Johnny, not yet. And shall we go downstairs and raid the icebox? After that huge dinner only a couple of hours ago and those drinks? Um, don't you think a little smooth sounds like a much better idea? Yeah, perhaps you're right. Good. You want to sprawl out on the sofa? I'll grab some sleep right here in this chair. <laughs> After what seemed like a couple of hours, he began to snore softly but deeply. Quietly as possible, I slipped out of the room and to the head of the long, dark staircase that led to the marble floor of the reception hall far below. Then, carefully feeling my way, one step at a time, I started down. And there they were, on the fourth step from the top. There must have been a couple of dozen of them. Small, small steel ball bearings that she and her boyfriend in New York had bought. Had Porter ever stepped on them? In one of his usual quick flights down those stairs, nothing in the world could possibly have saved him from crashing to the stone floor below. 
And when it was over, she could have gathered up those ball bearings, disposed of them, and nobody would have known the fall wasn't an accident by a blind man who simply missed a step that he couldn't see. There'd be nothing to suggest that he was pushed down the stairs because he wasn't. No marks where a wire might have been stretched across because there was none. No sign at all of what really happened. Carefully, still feeling my way in the dark, I collected the ball bearings from the stair tread and put them into my pocket. Then I went back up and started feeling my way back to Mr. Porter's. That's all right, Charlie. Mr. Porter. I've seen now what you planned for me. Or rather, my ears have told me. I'm sorry, Mr. Porter. And it looks as though you have given me an ending to my story, doesn't it? You mean your story is about this? About Denise? And her having got tired of living with an old man about her lover in New York? Yeah. I'm afraid I've known all along, Johnny, about a lot of things. And a man of my age married to a lovely young girl only half his age. I guess that's why I felt in the beginning, Mr. Porter, that if one of you were plotting to kill the other... It wouldn't be you. All I didn't know was how she would try it, or when. What will you do now, sir? No, I know it's really none of my affair. Now give me the little steel balls you found. When I give them to her, and she sees that I know... I guess from now on, mine will be a very lonely life, Johnny. I left him then, walked out to my car, drove back to my apartment, poured myself a good stiff drink, and have been quietly sitting here writing out this report. Whatever may have happened when he faced her with the evidence of her attempt to murder him is none of my affair. The expense account, forget it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Mandel Kramer to tell you about next week's story. Next week, I start out to collect a small debt, but instead I collect a bullet. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone... Produced by Bruno Zerato Jr., directed by Ed Oates. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. The part of Johnny Dollar was played by Mandel Kramer. Also heard were Alan Manson as Lou, Evelyn Joster as Denise, Raymond Edward Johnson as Porter, Eugene Francis as Randy. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking.